to see everybody today, and I'm not stopping the fellowship, I'm just going to talk over top of you, so that's all right, but we are thankful, thankful to be here today, and uh, looking good out there this morning, and uh, we're thankful for that as well. God's good to us, and it's just a joy to be here. We've enjoyed our Sunday school hour, and uh, looking forward now to our services, look forward to hearing the choir today, and they did a great job, 
And I know we've got a special song here in just a moment as well, but it's such a blessing to see everyone here, and uh, thank you for coming out. Hope everybody has a copy of our church bulletin, and they'll you'll find several different things in there, announcements of upcoming events and different meetings and uh, some projects and things we have planned, a uh, spring cleanup day coming up on May the 4th, and we hope everybody can come, husbands and wives, men and women, uh, our teenagers, get everybody out here for a few hours on a pretty, hopefully, spring morning, and we'll get a lot of things we need to done, take, done taken care of uh, quickly, and uh, we'll just kind of keep some things looking, looking their very best around here, and so we can get you to help us with that. And some other dates there, a joy date for our group, our joy group, our Just Over Youth group. That's the group of uh, folks in our church now that can get a discount on coffee at McDonald's. If you're old enough to do that, you're old enough to be in the joy group. And if you can't do that, you're out. You can't be in. you got to grow up some more first before you can get there. And uh, children want to grow up old enough to get in the youth group, the teenagers. And then once you get out of that, it's all downhill to you're old enough to get in the joy group, so uh, we have a good time, and so uh, we're going to be planning on going to breakfast uh, on uh, uh, April 23rd to Bob Evans, and we'll stop back through and go to Hatcher's Greenhouse. I love just going over there looking around, don't you? They have so many beautiful things, and by that time, you may be ready for something for your own yard or some, some flowers or something, so we'll make that a great morning and be back in here ready for you to do what you need to the rest of your day. And uh, so I hope you'll be praying about that. We're excited uh, on Sunday morning, the 28th, to have one of our missionary families here, Brother Dan Canavan and his family. We're going to be here in the Sunday morning services. He's a missionary in Ireland. He has triplets. He has two sons and a daughter, and they're triplets, all students at Crown Bible College down in Powell or Knoxville, Tennessee. And they're going to be finishing school. They're going to be here with their family and uh, they're home on furlough, just taking a few months to take care of some things here in the States before they go back to Ireland. And so we're excited to have them. They're our missionaries. They, we support them and partner together with them in their work and ministry in Ireland. And they'll give us a report and show us a video and help keep us up to date on what's going on there. And so we're looking forward to that. The family sings. And so we're looking forward to a good, good day on the 28th. So we hope you'll be there. Some other material that are here around the church, these uh, registration forms are available at all the entrances and exits of our church. These are our summer camp registrations for boys and girls who will have completed the first grade. They have to be going into the second grade when school will start again, all the way through the 12th grade. And this gives them information and helps them to get registered for camp. And uh, we're going to be having a meeting on the 28th after the evening service for people willing and interested in going to help us be our camp staff for that week. And we need your help. Husbands and wives can go. And uh, uh, men, women can go. We need everybody. And uh, we're excited about that. And we want your help. And it is always one of the greatest weeks of the year. And uh, the Lord blesses on that week, and we enjoy it so much. And so we hope that you'll be able to go and be with us uh, there on that week at uh, camp. Uh, it's great to have folks visiting with us in our services today. And uh, Miss Nell, who do you have here with you today? You've got two, da two daughters and their husbands here. One's from family from North Carolina, the other from Florida. And I told them I'm thankful they brought us some good weather when they came. And uh, so they've all... Uh, are in and so we're so thankful and excited to have them here and then others are visiting just a blessing to be here today we're going to ask our men if they will to come and we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings and our faith promise missions offerings that we want to faithfully give as we partner together with missionaries through our local church to touch the world with the gospel uh, if they're if a child of god will do five things they can really get a great grip on the christian life we ought to read our bible every day and we ought to pray every day. And we ought to be faithful to church. Be three service a week Christians to church. And we ought to share our faith in Christ. That's four things. And if we'll, if we'll let God give us the grace to faithfully give to our local church, our tithes, which God asks, and special offerings and missions offerings, 
What a privilege we can give and worship the Lord and further the Lord's work through our local church. Those five things, if we'll do them faithfully, we'll have a real grip on what it means to begin to live the Christian life. And so we hope that you'll do that. And uh, today we're going to pray, and our men will receive our offerings here this morning. Thank you. I believe mom and dad are going to sing a special here for us this morning. So we'll get them to go right ahead and do that. Sheltered in the 
thank you very much. Blessing today that song, and we hope today that uh, you all take your Bibles and open them with us this morning to the go- Gospel of John, and uh, open them to the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, John chapter 17, and we're going back into this uh, holiest of chapters in the Gospel records. And it is a chapter that is 26 verses long, and it is one prayer, one prayer. And it is the prayer of the Lord Jesus. It's the Lord's prayer, and we've been looking at it as we've been uh, moving through spring and up into Easter, and now uh, as we continue to look uh, beyond Easter into this chapter of God's Word, we come once again to the 17th chapter of John. Today we're going to begin to read in the 20th verse. And uh, this morning, I hope you'll notice a thought that we find here, that we find in verse 23, and a very similar thought in verse number 21. If we have a title for the message today, it would be, The Lord Jesus Prayed That the World May Know. The Lord Jesus Prayed That the World May Know. This is the prayer of the Lord. Let me begin to read there in verse 20, and I'm going to read down through verse number 23. The Bible says, Neither pray I for these alone, but but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And we'll stop right there, but you'll notice that phrase in the 23rd verse, that the world may know, that the world may know, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. And that's what our subject is today. This is what the Lord prayed about. This is the Lord's prayer, and that's why it's so special and important to us today. But let's pray together and we'll look into God's Word. Father, we are thankful again today that we can come here, that we can assemble together, and Lord, we can open up our Bibles. Thank you, Father, for caring and loving us enough not, not to deal with us secretly, but Lord, openly through Your Word. God, You laid upon the hearts of men through Your Holy Spirit to pin down the truths that we have in our Bibles. 1,500 years, over 40 different people, Lord, You... You impressed upon them through the work of the Holy Spirit to pin down your word as you revealed yourself to men, as you shared with us the truth about who you are, the truth about who we are, the truth about sin, the truth about how we need a Savior and what you did about that as you sent us your only begotten Son. Heavenly Father, thank you today. We can open up the word of God that's inspired and errant and infallible. And Lord, we know and believe today the Holy Spirit will take the Word of God and do His work in our hearts this morning. Father, we're looking to You to speak to us. If we know You as our Savior, we want You to speak to us. We want You, God, to deal with our hearts. We want You to show us, Father, how we can live obediently, closely to You, so that, Lord, we might fulfill the purpose for which You have us in this world. And, Lord, we know that You have us here for a purpose. You prayed about these things, those of Yours in the world we not be of the world, but that, Lord, we are sent into the world. Lord, today we understand that it's that they may know you and that, Father, you have sent your Son. And so, Lord, we pray that, God, you'll do what you need to do in our lives so that, Father, we can live a life that pleases you and is productive to you. And Lord, we pray maybe somebody's come to church this morning and maybe they've gone to church many other times, but, Lord, there's never been a time and a place in their life when they ever repented of their sin and they, left, Lord, rested their own soul in you and you alone, what you did for them as their personal Savior. And today, Lord, they have no assurance of that. They have no peace that comes from within in knowing, Lord, you as their Savior. And today, God, we pray you'll speak to them. And Lord, we pray that, God, you would gift them with faith that believes And Lord, we just trust God that they'll be saved. Lord, thank you that we can meet together as a local church to take care of these things today. And Lord, we're just asking now that you administer to every heart and every life. And Lord, we pray today, Father, that you would, God, draw us closer to you, that God, we might be 
Lord, what you would have us to be in this world. We'll thank you now again in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, when we think about our lives, we, we realize, I hope we realize, we need to realize that throughout our lives, after we've known Christ as our personal Savior, God will give us those that are His own, those that are His own, as He so often references the saved in this prayer. God will give His own opportunities and moments in our lives where we can make the choice of putting our life in His hands, of, of living for Him and serving Him in those moments. And sometimes we make the most of those moments. Sometimes we make the most of those opportunities and sometimes we miss them. And I'll be the first to admit I've had some of each of those. The moments when I felt like I allowed the Lord to use me for that moment, for that opportunity, for His glory, to help others to know Him. And then there's been times I'll have to say I probably missed that opportunity. I probably missed that moment because of whatever it was in my life I felt like was more important than putting my life in His hands. Letting Him use me in that moment, in that opportunity. Our moments and opportunities that we have, sometimes, sometimes they last for only so long. Sometimes they're like an opened up window and we can reach through that window and we can... We can be used of God for that moment and then the window closes. Sometimes they're an open door and we can step through that door and we can make the most of that moment as we put our life in His hands obediently, move forward through that door by faith, but then the door will shut and that moment will be gone. That opportunity will be gone. Our life as a child of God is filled with moments and opportunities where we can put our life in His hands. Let Him use us as an individual as an individual, for my family, as a pastor for our church, I don't want to miss those moments. I, I want us to make the most of them. I don't want us to miss the opportunities that we have to live for the Lord, to serve Him, to reach our world and impact eternity. I've said as we've looked through this 17th chapter of John from time to time that through prayer we can really get to know someone in a way that maybe we're unable to do so in any other way. I've shared with you how I've gotten to know men now, lifelong friends, that I've gotten to know more so than I could have any other way through times of prayer alone together uh, as we've taken our lives out of the world and for a few hours gotten together as men and prayed and our hearts have been opened up one to another. And we've seen what's on the inside, the burdens, the challenges, the, the, the desire of the hearts of men. We get to know people that way, sometimes more than any other way. Our lives are so busy, our families are so busy, things are so different and it seems as if sometimes it's hard to sustain certain things through periods of time. And there are times in my wife and I's life when we set aside time, we forced ourselves to take time and pray together. And you know, you, you, you learn something about your companion, even in prayer, that maybe you couldn't have learned any other way. Prayer. We know people, this is the Lord's prayer. In this prayer, we see into the heart of God. This is God at prayer, the Lord Jesus. He's God in this world. And He's praying. And here we see what makes His heart beat. Here we see what He is passionate about. Here we see what is on His heart and in His mind as He prays. I want you to notice in the 23rd verse, he says, In them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This is on the heart of God. He's praying that they may know. And then in the 21st verse, something very similar, but taking it one step further, he says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This is what is on the heart of the Lord. This is upon the heart of God. What? The world. That the world may know that you have sent me, that you, Father, love them as you love me. That they might know and believe. That's what's causing the Lord's heart to beat. 
That's what's the desire of his heart. Don't forget that in hours, he's going to make his way out of the Kidron Valley, having allowed himself to be taken captive. He will have been brought up and throughout the course of the early morning hours in the middle of the night, he'll go from one false mockery of a trial to the other until finally Pilate washes his hands of the Lord and all matters of the Lord in front of all the people and say, I find no fault in this man. This is an innocent man. And yet the people will cry out that he should be crucified, put to death, release Barabbas the thief, the robber, the terrorist. We would rather have him loose among our people than to have this Jesus crucify him. Let his blood be upon us. And Pilate, to please them, scourges him. Hopefully that will satisfy them, but no, their thirst for blood is so great they will not be satisfied until they see Him crucified. And He carries His cross out of the pavement, the place of the judgment at Gabbatha, out into the crowded streets of the Via Della Rosa, the way of the cross, and outside the gates of the city and up onto the Mount of Golgotha, stumbling under the load up the way of the cross, the hill. A, a, a Cyrenian, Simon, comes alongside to help Him and carries the cross with him, and as they lay it down, he lays down upon that cross. And there he allows his outstretched arms to be nailed to that cross, his feet nailed to the cross, he's lifted up. And there on the cross, God turns out the light of the sun, and God takes the sin of all of us, places it on His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the darkness, God pours His wrath out as divine judgment falls upon our sin on His Son, sinless Son. The Son who had only pleased the Father. The Son in whom there was no iniquity, no unrighteousness, and yet He became sin for us. And God dealt with the matter of sin in His Son. When God had exhausted all of His wrath, the Lord Jesus gave up His life and said it is finished and offered up His life in our behalf. The wages of sin is death and He died for our sin with our sin. All of this is happening in hours and the Lord is kneeling. And what is on His heart, you are on His heart. You God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. What is it the Lord is praying about? Father. Father, I'm praying that the world may know that you love them, that you sent me, and I'm praying that they'll believe. This is what's on the heart of God as He's praying. The Lord is praying, and the Lord is praying for His own. He's praying for His own. Those at that time who knew Him and believed, and those who would believe, He prays for them. His own. They're in the world. They are going to be kept by God's power. He prays, God, keep them from the evil of this world. Keep them. And we know that He sent them. He prays about them being sent into the world, out of the heart of God, into the world, praying so that they might reach the world, so that the world might know and that the world might believe. He prays about these things. This is what is on His heart and I'll tell you, it's sobering to know that you and I, knowing the Lord is our Savior, knowing He prayed for us here. He prayed that we would know and that we would believe. And after we've known and believed, He's prayed that God keeps us from the power of evil. He's praying that we be sent into the world. And He's praying today that you and I will take this message of the gospel so that the world may know and the world may believe. He's prayed about this. It's sobering to know that, isn't it? This is very personal prayer for you and I. He's prayed for you. He's prayed that we might go and we can have a part in the Lord's work in this world. You and I can have a part in that. The greatest work in all the world so that the lost and dying men of this world might both know and believe that God has loved them and sent His Son and the Son has died for them and lives again to save them that they might know and believe. What a sobering thought. You say, can we do it? Can this be done? Can we as God's people so live our lives that the world may know Him through us? I think yes, the answer is yes. If it were not so, He would have not, he would have not prayed about it. He would have not prayed that it be done. But it can be done. 
But I, I also say, you know, it's also possible that we as God's own in this world, we as God's own people, we can choose to so live that we miss the moments that He gives us. That we, that we waste away the opportunities that He gives us. That we hesitate and the doors close and the windows shut in such a way that we live so much like the world that we become a stumbling block to the world. And instead of helping them to come to know and believe, we, we actually, in fact, are being a hindrance to them knowing and believing. I believe that's also true. And the choice is with us. The prayer has been made. I, I, I want you to think about this. This prayer, this prayer of the Lord, these things that are upon His heart, hours before He's about to go to the cross, this is such a personal thing for us. In verse 20, He said, Neither pray I for these alone. Who's He talking about? These. He's talking about those disciples there. Now 11. Judas is gone and is filled with Satan and will betray Him and deliver Him into the hands of His enemy. Eleven of them remain, and he's praying for them. But he says, I'm not praying for these alone, but for them also which shall believe. You ought to mark that part because that part's you. Because you could put your name there. Because at this time, you were among the group who would believe, who shall believe. You're a part of the also, if you know Christ as your Savior. And he prayed for you here. And God used those who have come before us. He used them. He used those who who in their own life seized some moments and made the most of some of the opportunities of their life to speak for the Lord, to share of the Lord, to give their witness of the Lord, to take the Word of God and help us understand these truths so that we might come to know that God loves us and God sent His Son and that we might be able to believe in Him. There were someone before us sometime in their lives who made the most of the moments and seized the opportunities and were used of God until we heard the gospel and we were saved. And now may the Lord help us to be sure we're those people for someone else who's coming after us. Seizing the moments, making the most. We can't save souls, can we? The reality of it is we can't convert the lost. If we could, man, why would we want to sleep with 7 billion people in the world today? And if I could save them, if you could convert them, I think we would go night and day until we could reach every soul in all the world and save them and convert them. But we can't do that. But what can we do? We can witness of what the Lord has done in our lives. We can share the truth of what He did in our lives as He saved us, as He has converted us. And we can seize the moments God gives us to live for Him and serve Him. And we too can make the most of the opportunity of life the Lord has given us and share Him with the lost and dying world so that we can live and impact eternity before we die. God and His Word doesn't fail. The Gospel doesn't fail. The Holy Spirit will not fail. I know that I have failed Him many times in my life, but He never fails. And... God gives us these moments and we must recognize that I need to make the most of them, that you need to make the most of them. We must not let them slip by. God's heart is filled with compassion for the lost, just as we were. And His heart beats today that they may have that knowledge of Him shared with them that they may believe. Let me give you these three things real quick this morning. As we look at this passage of Scripture, as we think about this truth of what the Lord's praying about, what it encompasses, its impact. I want you to look at this. It begins, number one, with our relationship. The relationship we have with God. The relationship we have with God. In verse number 20 it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And you can mark their word with these Because that's the word of who he's talking about. He's talking about those that were there that night. Through their word, others would believe. Through their word, others would believe. Their word. God used the testimonies of those men. He used their lives surrendered to the hand of God. 
He used those men as they seized the moments and opportunities of their life to live for the Lord and share the Lord with the lost and dying world. And you know, it was their relationship with Him. It was their relationship with Him where it all began. Their relationship with Him uh, so that others could know the Lord and believe in Him. Uh, it, was that, it was that relationship that they had with Him that led to their words whereby others were saved and heard. He uses this thought of word through their word. We know we think about our testimony. Have you ever shared your testimony? Have you ever heard someone share their testimony? Or you give a gospel witness? You share a witness? We know this word witness, it speaks of someone who knows something. They have a fact that they are first-hand witnesses of. And so their testimony is valid. Their testimony has weight because it's a first-hand account of what took place in their life. And God wants to use your first-hand testimony of what He did in your life in saving you to help others come to know and believe in Him. Your Word, their Word, led to the salvation of others. Your Word will lead to the salvation of others. Uh, you say, Pastor, I don't know what that could possibly be. Well, it's just as simple as I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was destined to an eternity without Christ in hell, but then the Lord Jesus came into my life and showed me that I was a sinner. I knew I was lost and I knew I deserved to go to hell, but He loved me and gave Himself for me and died in my place and paid my sin debt. And Then He helped me to know and see that if I would repent of my sins, ask God the Father to forgive me for sending His Son to the cross, for my sin and I would rest and trust in Jesus Christ alone as my Savior I could be saved and I did and He did and I've been saved ever since something as simple as that it's just that simple and God is praying that we be the witnesses now share our word just as they shared one word of testimony means so much. Some of those men some of these men here God would use them to pin down the written word and we have it today preserved for us. Their word, the witness of the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the word of God today. The inspired word of God preserved for us and for the world. And you know that would not have happened unless they had a relationship with God first. They had to have that relationship first. And it all begins what the Lord prayed about here for us with our relationship with Him. It's where it begins. Verse number 21 says that they all may be one. That they all may be one. He goes on to say, one in us. That they all may be one, one in us. And in the 23rd verse, he says, I in them, thou in me, that they may be perfect in one. He's talking about being one in the Lord. One in the Lord. The Lord I in the Lord, He in me, the Lord in the Father, I in the Father through the Lord. This oneness, this relationship here that exists, uh, this oneness, our relationship with the Lord, one, not us two. Sometimes we say that, me and the Lord, that license plate, God is my co-pilot, you know. The two of us, sometimes we say that. But you know the reality of the matter is, it shouldn't be me and the Lord, it's us. A oneness that is there. A oneness. That's the way the Lord wants our relationship with Him to be. Together, one. We're sharing all things. Sharing this life. This life, not my own. It's His. It's ours. Oneness. In my life, this body's not to be my body. It's the Lord's body. In my life, He is in me and I'm in Him. It's not my time, it's His time, our time. It's not that He saved me and uh, you know, he, he, he saved me and gave me this life. This life is His now. It, it, it's His. Uh, the measure of my days are His days. I don't have my priorities. I don't have my plans. I don't have my goals. They should be His goals. They should be His priorities. Ours. We share them. We're one. This is the kind of relationship God wants to have uh, in our lives. We are one. And in this oneness, as the world sees Him, have our lives, live through our lives, they see Him. And they get to know Him. 
And if they get to know Him, they'll believe in Him. And they'll get to know Him through our relationship with Him and this oneness that our life now is His. And He lives through us. And the priorities for my life now are those He sets for me. And the plans for my life are those He has for me. And the way that I would go in life is the way that He leads me to go because we are one. We are one. This is the relationship. This is the way He wants it to be because this is how He prayed that it would be. A oneness. And how many times are we guilty of separating, compartmentalizing God into our lives somewhere to where He gets this time and that time and this day and that day, but all the rest is ours. And how, how little, how little bit of God does the world get to know through us because we limit the time that He is our life. And He's living through us. Our relationship with Him. Let's look at the second thing. The relationship we have with one another. Now remember, we're talking about His prayer. He's praying for His own in the world. Sent into the world to be kept from the world. Why? So that the world may know and believe. Our part in this begins with our relationship with Him. This oneness of giving Him our life. Letting Him have our lives. Our relationship with Him. But there's also a second thing. Our relationship with one another. Look at verse number 22. He says, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them. Notice that they may be one even as we are. Now he's talking about a oneness in our relationship with Him. But he's also talking about a oneness among those others that have a oneness with Him. Our relationship with others. Verse 22, that they may be one even as we are one. The world, the world will never see our relationship with God and they'll never see Him in us as they need to see Him if they do not see first a oneness in the hearts and lives of God's people and our hearts and lives together, a oneness among us. The Lord is praying about this here. This is what's on His heart. And he's praying that we that know him, that there be within our hearts and lives a relationship with one another, a oneness among us, a oneness that shows the world that there is a God, and that God is ruling our lives. He is reigning in our lives, and he's constraining our lives, and he's leading our lives, and guiding our lives, and there's a oneness in it that helps people to come to know that there is a God. And we can see Him in the lives of all of these people. Acts chapter 11 verse 26 is one of the first places in the Bible you'll find the word Christian used, this term Christian. It was used of the church in Antioch. I don't believe the term Christian was taken by the believers in the church and a term chosen by themselves to call themselves. I believe it was a term used from those without the church looking at them and how they lived their lives. Their oneness to Christ that they heard of and maybe saw and, and witnessed of His life, His life, His death, His burial, His resurrection. This Christ and those looking on at them, seeing a oneness among them and a oneness with Him, saying, what are we going to do with this crowd? We've never seen anything like this before. We're going to call them Christians because they resemble Christ so much. I don't believe the term was even complimentary. I believe it was probably a derogatory term thrown upon them. Them bunch of fanatics. Maybe that might be the way we would receive it. Fanatics. These Christians. Why? Because there was a oneness among them. Because their relationship with God overruled everything so that they had a oneness about their lives. And that oneness reflected the real living God. And even caused the outside lost world to recognize Christ even though maybe they didn't believe in Him. That's what he's talking about. A oneness that keeps, uh, that keeps us from the world. A oneness that keeps us from the evils of the world and causes us a oneness with one another among God's people and will send us into the world to reach the world that the world may know that there is a God who loved them and sent His Son and that they can believe in Him. We must have that oneness with one another that comes from our mutual love of the Lord and Savior ruling over everything. 
How could we ever have oneness among us if we didn't let our love of Christ overrule everything else? It has to have the preeminent place. And if it will, we can have a oneness. I'm to love you like the Lord loves you. And you're supposed to love me like the Lord loves me. And we are to have a oneness that the world can't break. We're to have a oneness that our flesh has no say-so in. We're to have a oneness that the devil can't penetrate and cause division and separation. We're to be one together, making the Lord known in this world in which we live. John chapter 13, if you'll turn back in your Bibles to the 13th chapter of John. In verse number 32, he's having a discussion here with his disciples. And in just a little bit, he's going to tell them that he's going away. He's going to the cross, beginning in John chapter 14. And in verse number 32 here of John chapter 13, he says, If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go you cannot come, so now I say to you. A new commandment I give you. Now listen, this is the Lord. He's speaking to His disciples. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. What's he talking about? He's talking about that oneness, that love of God, the love we have for God, the love we receive of God being reflected toward the others that know God so that we love one another as God loves us. And that creates a oneness that the world can't penetrate, that the devil can't separate, that our flesh can't dictate, a oneness in that love. And notice what he says in verse 35. By this shall men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Through that oneness, that love. Men know. They know what? They know there's a God in heaven who loves them. That there's a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people have embraced Him and He's embraced them and He is in them and they are in Him and they have that love one for another. They're united together in it and in it is an overruling factor that he has sent them to love the world and that they might reach the world with the gospel. A oneness. He prayed about this. We have to have that oneness in this love of the Lord ruling over our lives, trumping over all things. God's purposes in our life will be seen. We have to ask ourselves, do we live our lives conscientiously aware that everything we do or do not do affects the oneness of God's people. We can affect it. We can affect the oneness. Either how we do what we do or what we choose not to do, we can affect that oneness. And it affects the oneness of God's people. And if it affects that, it ultimately affects reaching the world with the gospel. How can the devil bring the work of God to a local church to a standstill? He can disrupt the oneness of that body of people. So they love themselves more than they love the Lord, and they love themselves more than they love one another in the Lord, to where they're separated and divided and bickering and fighting and backstabbing one another till the work of God grinds to a halt. And there ain't anybody going to go down to that church or listen to what those people in that community say that are associated with that church because there is no way they see the Lord in any of that. And the Lord prayed about this because He knew this was going to be a great hindrance to the work of God. He prayed about it. May the Lord help us that before we open our mouths that we think about what could what I'm about to say impact the oneness of the body of Christ. And in so doing that, impact the work of God. May the Lord help us before we push send and we send that text message or you make that post, whatever it is, we think about it. How can this impact the oneness 
of the work of God, the body of Christ, in reaching a lost and dying world. How can it impact that? The decisions we make, the choices we make, how we choose to act and react, the way we do the things we do and think about the things we think about them, we have to realize there's a oneness here at stake. The Lord prayed about this. It's necessary. It's essential so the work of the Lord can go forward. This is what's on the heart of God. The Lord prayed that we who know Him might be one. And in that oneness, we can be used to let others know that they might believe in Him who loves them and has saved us and sent us to reach them. The relationship begins with God, but it extends to one another. Now let's look at it from a third viewpoint. The relationship we have with the world. I'm not saying the world system. I'm saying the same way the Lord Jesus used it. God so loved the world, the people of the world. Our relationship with the lost world. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's look in verse number 14. Back up just a little bit in chapter 17. Notice some things that he said to them. In the 14th verse of John 17, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now the reality of the matter is, is if you know the Lord is your Savior, and you're endeavoring to seize the moments of life God gives you, the opportunities to put your life in His hands and live for Him, and you want a oneness in your relationship with God, and you want a oneness in your life among the people of God, and you're willing to put to death the flesh, and you're fighting the devil off through the obedience to the Scriptures, and you're not going down the way of the world. You're letting God lead and guide your way in life, and you're doing what you can to go into the world and reach God. I promise you today, the world will hate you for that. Why? Because it hated Him for that. And you are one with Him. And so you're going to receive the same hatred He did. Why? Because you're one. You remember when Paul wrote about that I may know Him, and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what Paul wanted. He wanted to be so in tune with the Lord and so at one with the Lord that he just was treated by the world the same way his Savior was treated by the world. And he was. And he said, that's what I want. That should be what we all want. It should be what we all want for our lives. This oneness. The world hates you if you're the Lord's. It hated him. Back in Matthew chapter 5, you can turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 or pin this down and you can go back and read it. Beginning in verse 43, he's speaking again here to his disciples and he says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. You've heard that, he said. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father, which, in, which is in heaven. For He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, this is a great message. We could preach all day on this message. But the Lord is helping His disciples to know and to understand that, yeah, the Pharisees and the Sadducees will tell you, you ought to love those that love you, but if they're your enemy, then you ought to just hate them. But the Lord said, what reward do you have in loving people who love you back? That's easy. It's easy to love people that love you. But what about the enemies that you have? What about the people who don't love you? What about the people that hate you? The Lord says, you're to love them. You're to love your enemies. It's not good just to say hello to the people who are willing to say hello to you, but say hello to the people who don't want to say hello to you. This is my way. This is who I am. And, uh, and he helps them to know that by doing that, you'll be recognized with me. There'll be a connection. There'll be a oneness. You'll be known as my children. 
And that's the way that we're to live our lives. And that's what he's teaching them here. And this is true. This must be true amongst God's people and with those we are among in this world. I tell you, it's hard to love cantankerous people, isn't it? It's hard to love contentious people that all they want to do is they're never happy unless they're stirring up contention. It's hard to love that. It's, it's hard to love the gossiper. It's hard to love the backstabber. It's hard to love the pot stirrer. But we have to love them. And by the way, that's just in the church. <laughs> Isn't it? That's not outside the church. That's just inside the church. What about the world? How are we to deal with them? Same way, we have to love them, don't we? We have to love them. We're to love one another. And we're to love those who are altogether unlovely because the Lord loved them. Because He prayed about it. Because He prayed that the Father, the Father loved them. And the Father sent Him to them. And He wants them all to know the Father loves them just as much as He loves Him. And that they can know and believe that they are saved. He wants them to know that. He wants us to know that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me finish up here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 4 is my life verse. Everybody that have a life verse. Find a verse in the Bible that has a certain special meaning for you. That kind of is a bedrock a principle upon which you want to build your life and live your life. That's my life verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But you have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power uh, may be of God and not of us. But I want you to back back up to verse number 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now he's telling his people they have a ministry. We have a ministry. We have a purpose. We have a reason. And that reason, that purpose is, is that we're to be in the world. We're not to be of the world. And He sent us into the world that the world may know and believe in Him. We have that ministry. And we have it. He says, but, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We look at a lost and a dying world today, and we see the God-haters. We see the ones who hate God, hate the Word of God, hate the church, desire to annihilate and stamp out the name of God in this world, who are the enemies of Bible-believing Christians. We look at them, and our natural response is to, is to throw up a wall and, and, to, and to return likeness and kind toward them. But don't forget, the God of this world has blinded their eyes to these truths. The devil hates them and wants to destroy them. And the and God loves them and wants them to be saved. And what do we do? We stand in the middle. We're standing in the middle. And we're to love them. He goes on to say, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. How can this... How can this devil-blinded, dark world who does not know the love of God or know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, how can they know they're sitting in darkness, blinded to the truth? How can they know? They'll know through us. We're the light. The light has shone in you. And now you are in the world, this dark world. And He's sending you forth like light into the darkness to help them come to know and see that God loves them and that the Lord Jesus Christ died for them and they can believe. They can believe. Verse number 7 says it. We have this treasure. What's the treasure? People always ask me that. What's the treasure? 
Are you thinking you're something? Are you saying you're something more than anybody else? No, no, it's not like that at all. There's nothing in me. The only good thing in me is the fact that I know Christ as my Savior, that He lives in me, and the treasure of the gospel is my own personal experience. And if you know Christ as your Savior, it's yours. And it's the most valuable thing in the world. It's far above money, wealth, position, power. It's the treasure that the world needs, and you have it. And it's not in some fancy package. It's in an earthen vessel. Nothing pleasing to the eye. He's chosen the base things of the world, the foolish things, he says, to confound us, the wise and the mighty and the powerful. And he sends us forth, his, his objects of grace, into the world containing the love of God. Knowing Christ is our Savior, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're not to attract people to us. We're to get people to Jesus. We're to try to help them see Him. And I'm not trying to win converts to me because if I get somebody to join this church because of me, it won't be long before they see something in me they don't like. They'll be out the door. It happens. But it's Jesus that we're winning people to. Jesus that we're leading people to. And if you look to Him, you'll never be disappointed. People will never be disappointed. Souls will be saved. One in Him. This is what He's praying for. That we'd be one in Him. He and the Father, we're in Him. One in our relationship with Him. One together in Him. Kept in oneness by an overruling love for Him. Loving the world and seeking to make the most of the opportunities we have in our lives so that others can know Him, so that others can know and believe in Him. This is what the Lord prayed about. You say you want to know what's on God's heart? This is what's on God's heart. When we have all the other things of life on our hearts, crowding out God and the things of God, you say, what, what, what? What, what should my heart be filled with and consumed with? This is what it should be filled with and consumed with because this is what was on the Lord's heart. These are the things He's prayed about. This is what He wants for your life. And I'll tell you what, if you're honest like me, it causes me to do some real evaluating. Doesn't it? Some real evaluating. Lord, how is your prayer being answered in my life? How is it being answered in my life? That we may be one with Him. Our relationship with Him, we may be one with Him. Our relationship with one another. That I'm being sure I do what I can, supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit, to yield my life to the Lord and to love you as He loves me so that we can be one. Why? So that the work of the Lord can go forward because this is what He prayed about. Watching what I say, what I do, how I live, so I'm not a stumbling block that I don't disrupt or break or be used as a way of division into that body by the devil, but being one, 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 so that the gospel can go, that what the Lord prayed about will become reality. That's what it's all about today. We're going to give an invitation, and invitation is the time of service where we, where we give you the opportunity to respond to God's Word, to respond to it. You say, how can coming to a service and listening to the preaching Help me in my life. Well, personally, it will help you when you respond to it and apply it by faith. We do it by faith. You say, well, I don't know about all that. I don't know any of my friends who are, are, are letting the Lord have their life. I don't know anybody that's doing that. Even though the Bible says we ought to give our lives as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewal of our mind. We may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I don't know anybody doing that. I don't know anybody that did like Paul, that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I liveth, but Christ liveth through me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave me. I don't know anybody doing that. Well, this is where the difference is made. Here's the opportunity God's giving you. The window's open now. And by faith, you just say, because God says it, and because He's directing that for my life, by faith, I'm going to do it. Because I believe this more than I believe anything else. Faith, acting, obeying, applying it to your life. Lining your life up with the Word of God. 
That's where it helps us. That's where it changes us. That's where the difference is made. That's where the transformation takes place. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. All How they become new, Pastor? By obeying the Word of God by faith. Even though we may not be able to see it and understand it right now, by faith we act upon it. That's what we do. That's what an invitation is for, to respond, to act, to apply, to, to, to receive and obey. And maybe if somebody's come to church today, you've come to church, but you've never ever in your life received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's never been a time and a place in your life where you ask God to forgive you of the sin that sent His Son to the cross, thank Him for loving you so much and giving His only begotten Son for you, and for Christ taking the penalty of your sin and God dealing with your sin through His Son, and that He lives today, and that you ask Him to forgive you. And that you just rest your soul in what He did for you. And you say, I, I, I believe what you said in the Word of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that. I'm doing that. I'm just kicking the props out of everything in my life and soul, but I'm putting them in the Lord's hands. And I'll be in heaven someday because of Jesus and what He's done for me. Maybe there's never been a time and a place you've ever done that in your life. Maybe you're a teenager Maybe you're a young person, husband, wife, grandparent, whatever age you are. Today, you realize, I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. What I'm going to invite you to do in a moment is just to respond by raising your hand and saying, that's me. And in responding, you're saying, I'd like to meet with you after the service is over and let you take God's Word and show me from the Bible how I can be saved. Maybe you're a young lady and you'd like one of our young women here to meet you after the service is over. They'll do that. A young man... Uh, we can get some of our young men to meet you. An adult, husband or wife, whatever. I'll meet with you. We're going to give you that opportunity. And I'm thankful God works in hearts and lives. But today, let's let God help us. This is the matter of the Lord's heart. And how are we in oneness with the Lord's heart in our lives? May the Lord help us to make those choices and seize the moments now that we'll make a difference in this world for Christ. We're going to bow our heads today, close our eyes. Maybe today you're here and you'd say, I need to know more about being saved. I want to meet with someone after the service is over. I want them to take a Bible and show me how I can trust Christ and settle the matter of my salvation. You say, but pastor, I rode in on a bus or a van. I know I don't have time because they have to leave. If you're willing to stay, we'll contact your parents and those responsible for you and tell them that you'll be a little bit late and one of our folks will bring you home. You don't have to worry about that. But you know right now, I need to trust Christ and be saved. I want someone to meet me after the service. I need to deal about this. Would you just hold your hand up for just a moment? I'll do nothing more than just acknowledge that and be sure that we meet you right after the service is over. Anybody in the service, just slip your hand up and write back. Hold it up where I can see it and write back. Maybe today you know the Lord is your Savior. How is this prayer of the Lord? How is it being realized by our obedience in our own life? That we're one with Him, that we're one with one another, so that a lost and dying world can see Him. This is what it's all about. This is what we want in our lives. May the Lord help us as He speaks to us. You know, the Lord will speak to you about, about specific things in your life that are hindering Him. He'll speak to you about them. And maybe it's not necessarily a specific thing but maybe just a just a general all over I know when I realize I need to make the most of the opportunities I need to I'm seeking the door I want the window to be open and Lord if you will open the door window I'll step through Lord I'm waiting on you maybe there's a young man here today the Lord's dealing with you about being a preacher a pastor a missionary or evangelist Lord you open the door window and I'll step through maybe you're here today family, Lord, dealing with you about going to be missionaries, or maybe a young lady here, you say, Lord, I'd be willing to be in Christian education, be a missionary, uh, be a pastor's wife, an evangelist, or whatever, God, you want me to do. I want to give you my life. I'll live for you and serve you. Lord, open the door. I'm ready. Make that official with the Lord tonight, today. Say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Use me. Whatever the Lord's speaking to your heart about today, be obedient. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name now, you have your way. May every one of us be obedient to you. Lord, may we be instruments, Lord, in the answer to your prayer. 
And Lord, we pray today that God will make the moments and opportunities you give us, we'll make the most out of them. And Lord, we want to give attention to our relationship with you. It's our life, not, not mine. It's ours. Not my time, our time. May we seek your leadership and guidance about our life. And Lord, we pray that, Father, we'll have that oneness among one another. Maybe there's some of God's people that need to mend some fences and they need to, need to bury some things and die to some things so that there'll be a oneness in the body of Christ so that we can move forward for the cause of Christ. Whatever the needs are, maybe somebody here that needs to be saved. Lord, maybe somebody's waiting for that open door and they're saying, Lord, I'll be willing. Lord, you meet the needs and answer prayer. And God, may we be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and take a hymn book, 296. Hymn number 296 in our hymn book. We're going to sing that first verse. And we encourage you. Maybe you need to slip out of your seat and come just publicly find a place to pray. Uh, we'll let you do that in private. Privately hear you and the Lord. We'll pray with you if you'd like for us to. But you come, you be obedient. Let's sing the very first verse of hymn 296 in our hymn books. <clears throat> Verse, verse 4. appreciate you being here today. God bless you for coming. It's been a good place to be, and God's blessed us, and we want to encourage you tonight to be back at 6 o'clock. Our services are at 6 on Sunday evening, and now with the time change, get out of here, and it's still daylight, and you feel like you got your whole day ahead of you, and you can get home and get ready for tomorrow, Monday, and all the things that go along with that, but we invite you to come back out this evening as well, and uh, looking forward to uh, the services. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. Just dismiss today and just ask God's blessings on all of you, your families and homes. And so we're looking forward to uh, being able to be together again. God bless you. We're going to pray together. And uh, I'd like to get uh, Brother Doug, if you would, just dismiss us in prayer, please.